Thank you all for coming. And welcome to the Independent Eye Program. Uh, my name is Christopher Smith. I'm a reference librarian here in genealogy and local history. And um, can't tell you how pleased I am. Um, we're going to get started right away. And uh, just want to make sure I get all the words in. In the 1960s, underground newspapers were considered by some to be subversive, radical publications. Now they are respected as cultural artifacts of the era. And that's where the library comes in. <laughs> the Independent Eye is Cincinnati's legendary counterculture alternative press. It provided political insight, artistic expression, a platform for underheard voices, along with promotion of artistic and musical happenings of the time. We are honored to have this panel of four individuals before us this evening. Um, to my right, right here, is Ellen Beerhorst. And keep in mind, I'm gonna keep these brief introductions. I could go on, I could write a small biography on each one. In early 1968, Ellen became one of the founding four of the Independent Eye. She holds a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cincinnati. She practices psychotherapy with couples and families and individuals. Particular, particular interests include young adults struggling to find life partnerships and our career paths. She is also a life um, long-standing interest in alternative lifestyles such as same-sex marriages and poly, poly, polyamory. She is also a teacher, forgive me, of the Alexander Technique and a lifelong Cincinnati resident. Monty Shear, and am I pronouncing that right, Monty? Shear. Shear, okay, I could remember that. Um, <laughs> Monty Shear, um, originally from Columbus, Ohio, Monty is one of the founding four of the I. He attended Hebrew Union College. Um, has a, also a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cincinnati. And I believe that is where Monty and Ellen met, um, if I'm not correct, but they could correct me shortly. Monty came all the way from Oakland, California for this event. So I just think that's pretty, pretty darn incredible. He has lived in Oakland for over 20 years, where he's also practiced um, psychology, his chosen field. Jim Tarbell, to, to Monty's right, um, what can I say about Jim? Jim is a man of many titles and roles. I'll just mention a mere few. Cincinnati City Councilman, Vice Mayor, Manager and Booking Agent of the legendary Ludlow Garage at the time, and responsible for many of the bands advertised in the eye and a tireless advocate for the city. Jim is here to keep us in tune to the scene at the time. He will tell you, as Ellen and he did himself, he was not directly involved in the eye, but he did advertise in it, and he was definitely a part of the community throughout the entire time. To the far right is Mark Neely. Mark is the inspiration behind this event and the creator of the 2019 commemorative edition of the Independent Eye, which will be out very shortly. And Mark will be able to fill you in much more on that. He is also a teacher and just a, a huge interest in history and, like I said, the inspiration behind what you're seeing here today. So we thank Mark for that. <laughs> welcome to the panel and welcome all of you. Um, there's many questions I could ask, but I guess I'm going to leave this open to the panel. Uh, many of you want to chime in, your mics are on. Um, so where did it begin? Um, why did it begin? Um, what was the inspiration? I know that Alex and Jennifer Verone were the founders, I believe. I have to say, because Jennifer would be standing up, yelling, and saying, I was never Jennifer Verone, I was Jennifer Coster. She was a big time feminist. And I'll just leave it on that. 
Thank you. <laughs> so, well, can you, can you... I'll, I'll give a little background. I was, we were do. trying to reconstruct how we got involved in this. I was a graduate, you were graduate students at the UC in, in clinical psychology. I, I remember that I was a subscriber to the New Republic. And as I recall, there was a, a Frenchman who was a uh, who wrote frequently for the New Republic then. This is before it turned against the war. Um, and he, he detailed all the ways in which we had lied about the history of our country. Uh, and I, it, 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 I was uh, shocked and dismayed. I mean, just very briefly, I mean, the, the, the Vietnamese had succeeded in forcing the French out. The French had used Vietnam as a colony, and the, and the Vietnamese threw them out. And there was a division between the North and the South. Uh, the, in the South it were mostly the people who had allied themselves with the French. And Ho Chi Minh in the North uh, uh, was uh, obviously opposed to them. and didn't want them to run the country once the French had been thrown out. Uh, so there was a near civil war, and there was a decision to divide the country along some parallel, I forget the numbers, infamous, and that some years after that, it was called the Geneva Accords, there would be a plebiscite for the whole country, and that would decide who would run the country. Well, our government perpetuated the lie that South Vietnam was a struggling democracy, and we needed to defend it, and we, with them, instigated in subverting the Geneva Accords so that the plebiscite would never be held. If it had been held, the North would have clearly won. So um, it was, I, I was reading the Republic. I remember reading now uh, a couple of books by Quakers that were also opposed to the war. But all that got me very aroused. And uh, I began to think, we have to do something against the war. There, and, and Polly Brokaw, who was the head of a, peace organization, a Quaker peace organization, uh, I joined her organization, and we sort of uh, moved it toward the Vietnam issue, and, and we called it Cincinnati Action for Peace. And uh, our original work was inviting speakers. Uh, speakers against the war, some Quakers, uh, also some civil, civil rights figures, uh, some famous civil rights figures, uh, uh, men whose names I would you would all recognize. If I could remember them, many became, one became a congressman, one I think the, the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, does that name mean anything? Oh. Yeah. Well, she was a great civil rights worker in, in the, that era, she came and spoke, and um, I recorded her talk, and it was one of my things I was most proud of was that I transcribed that talk and printed every word in the independent eye. I remember going to hear her with Monty at a church in, um, oh, what's that neighborhood? No, no, it was it was north of Evendale. It was a solid black neighborhood at that time. Lincoln Heights. Lincoln Heights. Lincoln Heights. Yeah. And we were the only white faces in, in the sea of people there. And it was a thrill to see Fanny Lou Hamer. Ooh. Herself. She was something. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was not... I, my parents were... Um, conservative politically and I was not one to be an activist and so Monty went all to these meetings by himself I didn't go and then he went to a meeting in the oh in Dayton or somewhere and uh, and met this Alex Verone guy and he came back all lit up oh this newspaper, it's called The Independent Eye. Alex and Jennifer are seniors at Antioch College, and they want 
this to be a regional paper for Southwest Ohio, and uh, we're going to help them, and it just seemed so wonderful. And we started in. So uh, you could take it from there. Well, I'll add a few de details. Uh, that paper was, I think, maybe on mimeograph paper. Yeah, absolutely. The first few editions. Yes. It was on mimeograph paper. And, uh, uh, we wanted to create uh, an underground newspaper. That was something that was coming into being around the country. And uh, fortunately, the, the uh, Yellow Springs News, I think that was the name of it, a daily newspaper there, was run by Quakers, a Quaker family, dedicated people. And they agreed to print our newspaper. They, this was uh, for free. For free, it was a, a linotype newspaper, you know, with hard um, uh, hot type, hot type made of what lead. <laughs> and it was it was just magical to go up there and see the the, the, the lead being uh, processed and the linotype putting it all together into these forms. For me, uh, one of the most surreal and, and sweet moments was seeing the, the newspaper come off the press. And when it came off the press, it would float above these uh, gas burners to, to give it enough drying so that when it landed on its pile, it was, it was dry enough to hold its egg. Uh, it, was, it was a lovely sight to see them one by one floating over, over those burners. Probably had a nice smell to it, I would think. Yes, yes. Of course, then, then Alex and Jennifer came to, to, um, to Cincinnati. I, I want to add one funny detail here. Um, Alex, Alex named it the Independent Eye, and it was ironic because Alex had one roving eye. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, it was, it was a good day, and we kept it. Um, so, we, um, I, I want, we, we initially had uh, some very talented people join us. Among them was Melvin Greer. I want Melvin to stand up. Where are you? Melvin is here. Melvin is here. He's in hiding. He's been in hiding. There he is. Thank you. Welcome, Melvin. Melvin is a celebrated photographer. Um, I, I guess he worked for the Inquirer. And and the Post. The Post. And many of the photographs that appeared in the eye were his. And in fact, this this photograph on the front of City Beat is a picture of. Uh, that's Alex. That's Alex and and Tom Hayden, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, so. And he was married to Jane Fonda at the time? Yes, yes, yes. He was, he was still out there demonstrating God bless her. She's been arrested twice in the last two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, City Beat article uh, is really wonderful. Uh, it was written by an author, Mackenzie Manley. I think she's here. Um, not sure where. Mackenzie did an yeah. incredible job. Oh, there here. she is. Thank yeah. you. Please check out that article. Yeah. Anyone else who, who, uh, who contributed to the I, I, I hope you'll stand up and, and give us your name. Uh, Jack Lilly. Jack Lilly. You said you wrote about campus issues primarily. What period did you work on the I? 69 and 70. Okay. That's when it was being published out in the Lloyd House where I still live. And who else is here that worked Now, is there on anybody it? here that was working on the eye when it was at 211 Calhoun? Yes. Stand up and Stand introduce up. yourself. Come, come over here. <laughs> Did you? <coughs> Say your name. Who are you? I was Bonnie Williams at the time. And yes, I went up to the Gallus Food Street office because it was around the corner from the free clinic. And we were working there. And it was probably Ellen. I was only 18. She okay. turned around and said, what can you do? She said, can you type? I said, yes. And that was the rest of history. <laughs> That's something, Bonnie. And 12 years later, I lived at 211 Calhoun. And I had no idea the eye had been there. 
<laughs> um, anyone else? Yes. Well, I was one of the kids that would sell it on Fountain Square. Ah. <laughs> oh, good. What's your, what is your name? Paula Wiggins. Paula and, uh, Wiggins? Paula Wiggins. I think Wiggins. it was after. I kind of hung out with the 532 Dick Smith people, Mark okay. Rothbaum, um, yeah, uh, Patty Johansson, Kathy Marlowe, yeah. Um, so that was maybe a little bit later. Um, you guys look so young. <laughs> well, I was in high school. I was in high school. I wrote a few articles for them, and, and, um, but that's, yeah. That was my era, it was kind of more toward late 60s, early 70s, because I graduated high school. What, 71, I think? 71, 72. <laughs> well, thank you for your part. Anyone else here tonight? Who, who, who will Hi. Um, I'm um, first saw the Iron. Um, What's your name? My name's Joe Richard. Joe Richard? Yes, I first saw the Iron. December of 69, I was going to the Black Dome, so I picked up a copy. Black so in December of 1970, I turned 17. I decided to finally call uh, to do volunteer work, so they had me up there three or four times in the Vine Street building before I caught fire doing paste-up work uh, for publication. Um, in fact, Alex even drove me home one, one day when I was up there. Um, I lived over in Dayton, Kentucky at the time. So Allie came me a ride home that day, and I was up there the day that uh, Channel 9 came up to interview Jennifer. I think it was August 26, 1970, for the Women's Day celebration. But I lost contact with them um, after the fire. I finally found a copy, probably in early 1971 again. And then I started taking some articles up there, letters that they published um, in 1971 about our high school I was going to. And uh, I had three letters that, that appeared in the paper from maybe February to uh, the end of March of 1971. And the 17-year-old B, I can see writing those letters, but the 66-year-old B wouldn't probably uh, write letters like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I never met, I always wondered what you two guys looked like. I never did meet you guys. Uh, the only people I really recall was Alex and Jennifer and then two sisters, Pat and Sue Saster. They don't look any different. That's what I'm saying. Anybody else? Yeah. Go. Okay. yeah, we've got Brenda back there, and we've got this I lady. Laugh. What, where's the mic? Oh, oh, okay. He's getting okay. the mic right there. My name is Brenda Greer, and uh, I was actually with Melvin when he was working on the eye. Uh, so. I would just kind of hang out with him and hang out with everybody else and just do the little things that I could do to help. Oh yeah. I really Thank you for doing that. Uh, well. Brenda and, and Melvin helped set up a dark room in our base and, and it was, it was I, I neat. Have, uh, it was I'm, really I'm, neat. So who's next? I am Marilyn Logan, and my son Richard had graduated from Andover in 1968 and was furious about the Vietnam War, so he tore up his draft cards and mailed it to Mr. Nixon. <laughs> and immediately his status changed to 4F, and he said he was on his way to Canada. But I said, wait a minute, I know there's a wonderful doctor that did some bone work on your father, and he'll give you a thing to you. He has terrible flat feet. So, <laughs> but he, uh, he was tangled up in all this stuff uh, after that, and uh, my, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was scary. Boys were going to Vietnam and coming back in boxes. Monty was telling me this afternoon what he wanted to tell you had to do with the horrors of the war. I think you ought to put that in. But just, just briefly, I, I, I don't know that we had any idea today of the scale of the war. Uh, just imagine to yourself for a moment the number of, 
of American soldiers that died in that war. What, what number you think it is? Uh, is, is? Does someone know offhand what it is? I know what it is. 58,000 American, actually boys, I think there were seven women as well, um, who died in that conflict. That's an extraordinary number. And, I mean, we've had nearly 6,000, I believe, or somewhat more, die in the Iraq and Afghanistan war. But this was another scale, right? Um, and of course, the, the, the Vietnamese, by some estimates, lost over a million people. Three, well, I believe there's some estimates that go as high as three, three million. So we're, we're talking about a horrific, horrific uh, tragedy. And of course, as, as Ellen was saying to me this afternoon, that's just those who died on the field. We're not talking about all those who came back injured, they came back with PTSD, whose, whose lives were shattered, were never the same. The suicide. And the suicide. Thank you. Well, so, thank you. So let's go back and, and pick up the, the remaining I person. <laughs> Say your name, please. Hi, I'm Kathy Veal Morgan, and I am part of the closing chapter of the I. Um, thanks to Mark for connecting up with me. 15-year-old um, me watched uh, one of my brother's friends being brought home in a box from the Vietnam War. 16-year-old me started reading issue one of Ms. Magazine. 17-year-old me, <laughs> ah, yay! 17-year-old um, me met some folks passing out the eye at either one of the Eaton Park summer concerts or the Dubu Park concerts. Those were uh, one of the venues for getting the eye out to people um, quickly and in large crowds. 17-year-old me, uh, got really attracted to the guy who uh, was passing out the copies. Uh, his name is Corky Johnson. Uh, somebody's laughing. <laughs> so um, Corky became the last editor of the Eye. Uh, Corky and I um, lived together. Um, we wound up inheriting the Eye from Mike Wood uh, when he and his then wife, Ellen, lived at 2323 Highland. Um, so, I know Corky and Mark have had a number of conversations because uh, I passed Corky's information over to Mark and said, you know, you really need to talk to this guy. Um, not only was he the last editor, he's got a much better memory than I do. He was involved before I was. Um, and uh, he eventually became an investigative journalist. So it really was a defining chapter in his life. For me, it was, uh, kind of coming of age and helping shape my world views. And uh, for me, it's a really special thrill to see this through Mark's eyes and to meet the people who started it all. I had never met you guys. So I'd be glad to uh, chat with folks afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Michael Wood became very, I guess he was editor, manager, he was the guy for a while in the Vine Street era. And his widow is here tonight. Would you stand up? Yeah. There she is. Thank you for coming. If you want to say something about it, did you know Michael at the time that he was working on the eye? Um, no, I didn't. I came to Cincinnati from Northern Ohio in 1972 to go to University of Cincinnati. But um, I did not know Michael until, okay, I wanna say later, late in the 80s. Um, and, but I was with him when he started the investigation along with Mike Avey. And I don't know if anyone had contacted him but it was about the, the fire that happened on Vine Street Hill. And I think they, they, they and some of the other folks with the eye were instrumental in getting the lawsuit with the city um, underway and actually then winning that lawsuit. They won. They yes. did win. I'll be darned. What, what, what did they win? Um, I, I don't think it was much in the way of a monetary thing. I think it was more of a, you know, that they wanted, they wanted, they wanted justice. The, the justice. And, and so, what yeah. did the city admit? 
Um, they had, I believe, they admitted that there was that the um, eye was was firebombed, that it was done, in, you know, that it was. I don't know that they ever admitted that it was the police, which was what they often thought. But um, I think that they did admit that it was that it was in some part their the city's fault. In a way, I have all the papers in my basement, and if anybody's interested, <laughs> you can probably dig it out. That's great. What? What? Tell me again your first name. Sharon. Sharon Wood. Okay, the Wood family, Michael was Maureen and Katie Wood's brother and Peggy Wood's brother. Um, Michael was a firebrand. He used to appear on Wave Radio regularly. He was a labor organizer, an electrician, a brilliant guy. Okay, so where was I going? Uh, well, I could... Are there any other people who worked on the eye? Anybody out there? If not, we'll get to you later, I promise. Oh, here's a guy standing up. Give that man a mic. What, a, what about no? I mean, um, is that no one we're talking about, Maureen Wood? Is yeah. that Good evening, Mike's? everybody. Maureen from, Wood, the organizer the, From Northside. From that, Northside, who did everything. Yes. That's Mike's sister. I that's no Mike's sister. Chase School. I mean, yeah, Chase School. Oh, right no. Okay, so give us your name, please. Uh, my name is John Parkin, and uh, I... John Parkin? Uh, John Parkin. I lived with Michael Wood at 211 Calhoun from late 1972 into the early autumn of 73 and worked on the eye. That was a condition of living in the eye commune at that time. <laughs> And um, Mike certainly was all that everybody said about him. He was the leader, and he could be very inspiring. He was very knowledgeable about things. Whenever I talked to him, I learned something. I remember what Monty said. Once I drove Mike all the way out into southern Ohio, and we had the paper printed off out there, and I remember watching him skimming over. I thought, Indiana. wow, this is really something. Yeah. Wasn't Maybe it one. Indiana? I, my you said Ohio. I think it was in Southern Ohio. Oh, okay. I, I thought so. we were Southern Ohio. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> uh, the Northern Southern right. Ohio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the the, the Ohio Southern. Bible Belt. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. But um, I once interviewed a student from South Vietnam. His name was Vu Quang Viet. And he was part of a group of students in South Vietnam who were opposed to the government. And uh, he was being deported, but he granted an interview that got published in the eye. I interviewed him and then typed it up and got it in. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, thank you, John. Oh, you're thank you, John. I did have a little story I wanted to share that Kathy had shared with me. This is a copy of the last issue of the eye, and they used red ink, and she told me about how expensive that was to make that happen. And they were giving this out at the World Series in 1975. And as she said, she said a lot of people just grabbed it thinking it was something about the Reds. <laughs> and I think that's just wonderful. That's my artwork, too. And it is her artwork as artwork. well. Artwork. Put quotes around that. <laughs> And is, yeah, at the conclusion, is there any way that we could get a photograph of anyone who was involved? Yes. Oh, like yeah, a group of anyone photograph willing, of we'll everyone definitely do who that. was, that would be great. We'll thank you. I don't you. know if everybody heard, but yeah. 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 We'll Andy's. gather for photos at the end, and thank you for in advance for doing that. I'm just going to just drift a bit. I want to get down to the end of the table with Mark, and if he could share his story. Um, how it came to be, why he's here. Sure, well, um, I use the term fate a lot when describing this process, how it all came about, because it really did feel that way. I had read a book uh, last November uh, by an author named Jean-Francois Bizo, and the book was simply called Free Press, and it was essentially about the movement in the late 1960s where these underground papers gained all this momentum uh, all around the country. And 
I guess I was just naive. I mean, there were so many, I mean, in the hundreds, in every pocket of the country, uh, opposition to the war was kind of the main through line of all these papers, and then they sectored out into a lot of these new left movements. Um, and I came across this list of papers in all these different cities, and when I saw one from Cincinnati called The Independent Eye, I just had to find it. Uh, I'm a big collector in general, so that's, that's just what I do. And so at first I reached out to anyone I know. I'm, I'm an artist and I reached out to people in local creative circles and no one had heard of this <laughs> at all. And I kind of felt like I stumbled on this treasure chest all of a sudden. And, uh, should have checked the library first because I used to work here. <laughs> <laughs> And so I, I came and I found that uh, the library here had a large part of the collection, almost the whole run, in their rare book room that Ellen had donated that I found out later. Uh, my wife and I went in one Saturday, and as soon as we opened the archive, um, I was just struck by it, uh, almost on an emotional level. Uh, I, I was just so shocked that something like this existed in Cincinnati considering our uh, conservative history. Um, and as an artist, I was drawn by the artwork, just that classic ink on paper style, the collage. I was just taken by it. Uh, we saw uh, one of the covers for the International Women's March in 1971. Uh, having marched in the Women's March here a couple years ago, uh, I just made that connection to the lineage to today. And uh, Brian Powers, who's here uh, filming right now, uh, he was the librarian. The yes. Um, he said, hey, why are you interested in these? And uh, we struck, a, struck up a conversation. And he said, oh, let me call my friend Jim Tarbell. And he just took out his phone and handed it to me. Um, and I was intimidated. Uh, and Jim was uh, so kind to me, he immediately got me in touch with Ellen. And I ended up meeting with Ellen, um, which was just so lovely. We went to her house in Clifton, and I didn't know at the time where I was going, and I walked in, and Ellen said, oh, here's the big communal table where we put the paper together. Um, and we met for a couple hours, and uh, basically I spent, I've spent the last year uh, contacting every single name I could find uh, that was associated with the paper. Uh, met with a lot of people, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of people in this room, uh, Melvin, Bonnie, Kathy, um, Joe, I could go on. And it's great to meet a lot of you today um, after having emails and phone conversations all this time. Um, the library asked if I would do something, if I would create um, some sort of curated event, an exhibition. And really, the project uh, quickly formed a couple of different legs. Uh, we wanted to have the exhibition, we wanted to have the event today, and we also wanted to digitize the whole archive of the Independent Eye. To me, that was always the most important part because it makes it permanent. And it allows uh, younger generations, future generations to see the paper. Um, and it also allows um, all of the remaining members uh, who were involved to relive those days. Um, and also, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but uh, I partnered with a friend of mine named John and we're creating a, a tribute edition of The Independent Eye. Uh, very grateful that People's Liberty uh, recently funded that for us. Um, so that I know some of the artists are here. And I, I just wanted to share um, one more thing. Um, as Kathy had mentioned, um, she had got me in touch with uh, Corky Johnson, who was one of the late editors in the 70s. And one of the cool things for me is I met a lot of people involved in the paper after Ellen and Monty were involved, who never got to meet them. And I just wanted to share something um, that Corky had wrote to me. We had talked on the phone for a couple of hours, and this is something he sent me later after I sent him the digital archive. He said, Mark, it was good reminiscing with you about way back in the day. Thank you for sending me the digital file and for undertaking the I project. As I mentioned, I was somewhat ambivalent, not about your project, but about looking at the old papers. 
but after spending time with them, it brought back some powerful, mostly fond memories. Honestly, I became rather emotional. Much of that probably had to do with knowing that a number of us are no longer around. Mark, please give Ellen, Monty, and all original staff folks my very best. Although, although I never met them, I believe we must be kindred spirits in some, some such way. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Mark. I mean, uh, we're so indebted to you that, that, that you took the initiative to do this. Uh, it, it means so much to us. Likewise. Thank you. you know, <laughs> You've given us our 15 minutes of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to draw attention to Jim Tarbell. Um, as we stated, and as he was stated, he was not directly involved in the paper, but what do you have to say about the, the paper, Jim, and your role? He was the booking agent and manager of the Ludlow Garage at the time. Owner. Owner, <laughs> forgive me. I meant... <laughs> yeah, the manager gets paid. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Today, you know, since then, uh, this uh, says so much about Cincinnati. I keep insisting people that didn't grow up here or grew up here and just weren't paying attention <laughs> that Cincinnati is so unique that it, it uh, could provide support for something like this in the first place. And then 50 years later, uh, there are this many people still living. <laughs> in some way or another, knew about it, uh, read it, whatever. I, did, I did really didn't, uh, I was very, very much on the periphery of this newspaper, um, practically speaking, spiritually, uh, very much at one with this paper and what it stood for at the time. I was so lucky to grow up here in a family that was um, hitting it pretty good on all eight, I think, <laughs> in terms of their social attitudes and their feelings about uh, where we were going in, Cincinnati, in, the, in, in, the, in the country and in, in the world in so many ways. And um, prior to the I, it was the occasional visit to the Yellow Springs to Antioch that kept me going, you know. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Little Art Theater and um, anyway, uh, when, uh, when Mark called, I, I, I thought I was hearing something uh, from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> that this should, uh, this should come back 50 years later and uh, give us a chance to revisit. I have to acknowledge, I think, uh, that whoever's the, not Carl, I don't want to embarrass you, but I, I have a feeling you're the oldest one here, and I think that whoever's the oldest one here should get an award or at least a hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. That would be Carl Solway, I think, um, and uh, uh, I think that's when I met Carl and um, and Mrs. Uh, a little bit later. Um, I, you know, I uh, have always had a marriage with uh, journalism since I was a kid, since I was four. Is the um, first time I met my father? He was in the war. He was in France during World War II. Came back when I was four. I don't remember anything. For that, but um, let me. But it, I'm glad that uh, this didn't happen before. I remember. Um, He's getting out his phone. Yeah, I'm so sorry, but I will just take one moment here. Of course, I didn't bring my glasses. I can't turn it off. <laughs> In any exactly event, right yeah, you thank you. Um, the. Uh, Now I gotta figure out how to do it. <laughs> I, uh, and, and what I was about to say may help explain why I can't do this, because growing up I was ADD, uh, dyslexic, agnostic, <laughs> NBC, CBS, you name it, you know, I had it. And, um, so I, it was a lot easier for me to, to read uh, short pieces. And um, I just wasn't a reader. I couldn't, I couldn't read fast enough to really kind of keep it together. And um, now you know more than most people in my family. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but my father was um, 
took journalism in, high, in, in college and um, didn't practice journalism, but his, uh, his father was managing editor of the Post Time Star. And um, the, uh, uh, and, and Ida, you know, who I'm, is a shirt tail cousin, never met her, but I certainly claim her. Uh, anybody that has an odd name like that, you, you gotta take an interest in uh, the name Tarbell and finding out what she was all about in terms of her mud raking and suffragetting uh, was caught my attention as a kid. Um, I, I sold the Empire in Hyde Park Square when I was 11 years old. Uh, I delivered the Eastern Hills Journal when I was 13, door to door. Um, and um, I lived next door to um, Sylvia Lott's Beach. Aww. Sylvia Taft Lott's Beach, who was uh, very active in the Quaker movement, and her husband Bill, who became chairman of the Quakers uh, later, and uh, Polly Brokaw. I was in Fellowship House as a kid in high school. And Fellowship House was an anti-war organization, but they were a social action organization, and they had an adult group, which Polly was a member of that uh, Monty talked about. And, but they also had a, a, a high school group. And that was a, a citywide um, melting pot of all kinds of people that I did not know growing up living in Hyde Park or going to St. X High School. Um, and it was a, a wholly different experience for me. It opened my eyes to a lot of things, and um, one of which was, as a 15-year-old, the idea of a youth center uh, to start talking about those things that we weren't talking about that in school, maybe at home. So maybe you'd find some other people that had that experience as teenagers. Um, I went away to New England, um, and thought I was going to be a doctor, but you had to read in order to be a doctor. <laughs> my bedside care physician said, oh, you'll be, my professor said, you'll be just fine, but my chemistry and physics professor said, you cannot, you will not be a doctor at all. <laughs> and so, um, worked as a commercial fisherman for a while, came back, and um, one thing led to another. Uh, I came back to, to be the director of a teen center. And this was 1967. When director of a what center? Uh, of a teen, teen center. A center. teen center. Yeah, this center. was a way station for uh, kids who were not hanging around the house. In my case, my father was dead and my mother was working and I, there was no, no reason, no place for me to go after school. And so, then I found that there were other guys like me uh, they were kind of hanging out and why don't we start a way station for uh, us uh, folks and uh, worked on that idea as a, at the age of 15, it didn't happen. Later on at age 25, it did happen, totally unrelated. And I was invited to come back and be the director. Don't ask me, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. But when I got this letter, uh, I thought, well, but I guess they don't have any choice. It was something I worked on when I was 15. So I came back and directed this teen center for a while, and uh, it was a good idea, but it wasn't going, it wasn't meant to be for very long. And but that led to uh, my going on my own to start some semblance of a center for uh, young adults, and um, that's where the Lovelo Garage came from. Sorry, it took so long to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and if I could add, the Grateful Dead played at the Teen Center. They did, yes. <laughs> it was, uh, um, that's a whole nother night. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot more entertaining. We should have a Ludlow Garage Night. Uh, we should have a Ludlow Garage Night for the library. That's a whole other program. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I met, uh, I know her longer, I think, than anybody in this room, I'll bet you. Because I met, am I allowed to say your name? You are. All right. <laughs> I met her when she was Schusty Beerhorst. Now, if you think you can avoid meeting somebody and spending time, maybe you're crazy because it's too much fun uh, meeting Schusty Beerhorst. You know, and finding out, what's that mean? You know, where does that come from? And uh, that's because she and my sister were in high school together at Warren Hills, class of 58. That's why. And um, 
So when she came back reincarnated uh, as, as this uh, radical journalist, well, I had to start paying attention. Um, but the garage was an extension of the stuff that I just mentioned about what I felt uh, was a need. And um, the, the garage, truth be known, was really to be a community center. It's gonna have an art program and a speaker's program and, and music. Well, it didn't take long for music to take precedence, you know, as the reason for being there. And um, it was also, uh, Cincinnati had a wonderful music scene, historically and currently at the time. Um, so we had great talent here, but it seemed like there was a bigger picture out there, and I thought it would be fun to address that if possible, and that became uh, really the focal point of the garage. But uh, it, it, it ties in with, with uh, social action in its own way, of course. And, um, well, Jim, it was important to get your advertising dollars. <laughs> right. we yeah. had and we're better to do that than in the eye. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That's my real connection with the eye. I was an advertiser. Yeah. And, uh, That's right. Well, well, <laughs> oh, it was, it was vital. I had something to say. Yeah. I, I, do we have a, a time when we turn into pumpkins? We've got a while. We're we okay. We've got a little while. We're, we're okay. Well, if I can interrupt Jim's fascinating uh, story. Uh, get to the story. point, Tarbell, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, here we are, we were doing it. It was 50 years ago. We were very young. And here's Mark, and he's young now. How old are you, Mark? 29. Yeah, well, <laughs> not as young as we were then, but um, from my perspective, you're, you're a juvenile one. But what I wanted to say about it is that when Mark <coughs> came to my house and um, met me and saw the house, this house is, is quite something, it's that it's that big stone castle-y thing on Clifton Avenue. That's the Lloyd House. Uh, so many things to share with you. By the way, I would much rather stand up. I can see people. Uh, forgive me for, for doing that. I thought this came out, but it doesn't. Um, so when Mark came, to meet me, and I took him in the dining room, and I said casually, and this is where we did the makeup and the layout. Thanks. Uh, and he was visibly impressed. You could just hear the oohs and the ahs coming off of him. And I thought, look at this. Here we are, legendary. <laughs> now. Back in the day, I mean, if, if somebody could have come into that dining room when we were, you know, 30 hippies swarming all night over this table putting out this newspaper, and that was a process, I can tell you, and said to us, oh, well, in 50 years, there'll be a... <laughs> There'll be a show at the library, <laughs> and there'll be <clears throat> young people who will think you were ooh and ah material. We would have laughed them out the door. Because you have to understand, at the time, although we felt deeply and passionately about the horrible, horrible war, and would have done anything to shorten it, to end it. Yeah. I'm falling down the hole. Melvin, what are you going to say, Melvin? <laughs> Let me say this. <clears throat> Maybe you and Monty don't remember, but that big table, had a white tablecloth on it one evening. 
And you remember when Tom McGreevy came in? Yeah. He was barefooted. He got mad about something. He jumped up and started walking up and down on that white tablecloth <laughs> and leaving black footprints. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember it. I'll never forget it. <laughs> never. And, and when I came to the Independent Eye, I had been in the Air Force for four years. So my thing was not so much anti-war as civil rights because I'd been stationed for two or three months in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, that was still segregating. So my thrust was more about civil rights than the war. Just want to point that out, thank you. And if I may, thank you. And that kind of leads me to the next question. Pretty much every issue that they tackled in the eye whether it be civil rights, equal rights, gay rights, women's rights. Um, the, the fact that the government was lying about the war, this, that, and the other. But all these things came to be issues we're talking about today. Um, and a lot of them came to be. And I'm going to throw this out to Ellen and Monty. You were considered this radical, subversive paper by some, but yet the things you were advocating, they've come to be. We now do have, we are in better shape. We, we still have ways to go, but uh, we're in better condition in terms of those issues, comparatively speaking, than 50 years ago. I would say in ways, in ways. We have a long way to go but the things you were advocating in your paper are still issues we're talking about today. And I wondered how you feel about that. Well, I, I want to say something. You know, I knew that there would be two or three people here <laughs> and I'd have a microphone. And so I've been thinking about it. What do I want to tell you? What do I want to say to you? And it's something like this. We were voices crying in the wilderness. We were vilified by the dominant culture. The fact that the police bombed the eye office, I mean, come on. That was just, you think that's really shocking and scandalous, but it's just a symbol of how frightened everyone, the dominant culture was of us and our mission. It was anti-patriotic. You were supposed to get out there and support our troops. So we were a tiny, tiny minority and it was scary. And yes, our phone was tapped. And yes, we did have a big fat file in Washington at the FBI. And it was very strange to be seen. While we were seeing ourselves as heartfelt patriots doing what our country needed for us to do, and yet we were vilified and seen as subversives and dangerous. You have to understand we were seen as dangerous. So today, so there's a few young people here today and besides Mark. And I want to say something to you that it's important to stand up and do your tiny bit. I thought we were doing our teeny tiny bit. Even though we printed a whole huge 2,000 copies of each issue, which is nothing. But still, we were doing our teeny tiny bit, and yet it gets magnified over time. And we were justified. We were, 
we were shown to be on the side of history. You were on the right side. On the right side. And the dominant view today is that the Vietnam War was a terrible thing. And we were right to oppose it. And yes, the government lied to us and to the world. So what I want to say is don't, don't be discouraged in this era. If you feel like there's something that you care deeply about, something that appalls you about our government's position, like maybe climate change? <laughs> yeah. Yeah! Um, get to work. Do stuff. Newspaper is not the way, but we've got social media and we've got all kinds of internet tools and it's not so hard to find your cohort. Not hard at all to find your your peeps in in the things that you care about deeply. So if you feel like oh there's nothing I can do well, I don't know what that's about, but I, I just want you to be active and, and follow your heart and, and go out there courageously. Because history has a way of being a megaphone, and that certainly was true of us and for us. Thank you, Ellen. I wanted to give a personal thank you to Ellen as well. She welcomed me into her home a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had green tea and cheese and conversation. And it was a wonderful time and I learned so much. And she gave me a tour of her incredible home, um, a house that I'd noticed for years. So there was two wonderful, I met some great people. And um, she's a wonderful tour guide. Thanks. You, you're very welcome. But it does lead me, if I, if I may, um, you mentioned the schism that happened on the staff of the Independent Eye that changed the course of the paper, if you will, or at least those working with the paper. And can you elaborate on that? I, I can say it literally. You probably remember more than I do, Ellen. Well, it's all about that editorial you were reading for me. Oh, I, I found an editorial I wrote for the Eye in September of 68. Uh, in which I took on the issue of the language we use as those opposed to the war. And I, I was reflecting on the fact that sometimes we use military language to describe our, our peace-loving actions, calling theater, for example, guerrilla theater, uh, um, calling and using ugly terms for those we oppose, calling the police fascists and, and pigs. And, uh, and I was insisting in my editorial that, that, we, um, that we pay attention to the language we use. I, I remember particularly that I was always concerned that the, the, the Hawks had, had seized the word patriotism as their word. And I thought we should never give up the word patriotism. Patri we were the patriots. Yep. And we needed to, consist, to insist on that. Well, that takes me a little bit away from the, the schism. The, you know, we, we, were, we were divided in those of us opposed to the war. Uh, some, some felt that some kind of violence, some kind of, uh, was, was necessary. And uh, we had one member of the paper, I guess Ted? Some, yeah, Ted, we'll call him Ted for here, uh, <laughs> who thought we wanted to call the police pigs and finally got disgusted with us and formed his own newspaper. Um, and uh, had his own salesman selling it on the on the streets, and I, you know, I guess that's that's what democracy is about. Uh, you have different points of view; you're represented in different ways. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ellen? Well, on the schism? Yeah. So we were so naive. I'm sorry. I like to see the faces. If I hide behind the table, I can't see anybody. So we were so naive, we thought anybody who would come to the business meeting would get a vote. So there was this showdown business meeting. 
where we're going to talk about whether it would be our policy to be violence promoting and off the pigs, that was the phrase, or whether we would be more Quakerish and and like what Monty was saying. So uh, we had this meeting, and, and there were many more people who flooded in to that meeting than had ever come to a, to a work session. There, remember, the, the library was overflowing with that meeting. And, and we had a vote, and everybody had a vote, and the people who had been recruited, I don't know from where, to come in and, and vote for the violence uh, had their day, and and that's how that that's how the the policy shifted, and I was broken hearted. By that time, Monty wasn't doing so much, and but I was running the the table. I was running the production. I was designing the paper. I'm so proud of it when I look back and see what a great job I did. <laughs> oh, by the way, pause. I have, to this day, a publication. And if you go to www.lloydhouse.com, you too can subscribe to the virtual salon, which, you know, once you start, you get the printer's ink in your blood, and you can't let go. So uh, I still have a weekly newsletter. So we had this showdown meeting, and the, the doves among us were voted down. And I was heartbroken and I said, well, you'll have to find some other venue to put the paper out and I'm not gonna organize or design it. And I, I was burnt to a crisp. But by that time, Chris, they, the people like Walter Cronkite were showing coffins coming off of planes and they were reporting on me live, and they were letting the general public know that, that this was a stinking, lying, horrible, bloody, awful war. So that's how the schism happened, and they, they rented a, a place on Vine Street, it's still there, and that's where that firebombing happened, remember that? And uh, so I, I know almost nothing about what the paper was doing once it left my dining room. So. Did you continue to read the paper? You know, I don't think so. I had a, I had a baby, I had a house, I had a practice, I had to get my PhD finished. So it was, uh, no, I don't, th I don't think I even saw it. As a matter of fact, Mark, you managed somehow to, to dredge up all the copies of a, all, a, a copy of every issue. I have no idea how you did that. You want to tell us? Because I donated to the library all the issues that Monty and I had participated in. The Yellow Springs News, hot type issues, and, and, and the, uh, you know, the offset press issues. But there were, there were the, the mimeographed issues and then the subsequent Vine Street issues. Right. Maybe you could tell us about that. Sure. Well, when I first got here uh, last okay. year, I I like know. You want to just use mine? Is that? Oh, okay. Oh. Mic check. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when I got down to the library last year, uh, they had Ellen's whole collection, and they had 1968 through 71, the whole run. Uh, the paper started in February of 68, and those were those original mimeographed, almost newsletters that were published in Yellow Springs. And uh, then there were some sporadic issues that someone had been into the library that were from 71 through 75. It was so challenging to find copies. Uh, I mean, it just, they were on this very thin, almost disposable newsprint, and I just found people didn't keep them. It was over 50 years ago. It was so challenging. Um, I reached out to different libraries. I reached out to Antioch College in Yellow Springs, their library. 
Um, really, the way I found a lot of the missing links was uh, they actually came from Melvin Greer. Uh, he had given a box of papers to John Hughes. Uh, I'm not sure if John is here, but uh, a longtime UC professor. Uh, Greg Hand, who I know is here, he got me in touch with John. And um, I met with him, and he just happened to have this box sitting in his dark room uh, at UC. And that's where the missing links came from. So we have Melvin to credit for that. Um, he had given John um, his collection of papers, and that's how we have all of them, Ellen. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that um, Kathy, right out here in the blue, they're still addressed. Um, they were being mailed to the library um, in 74 and 75. And so we kept those in the rare book room to this day. And if I might add, they will be bound shortly. The ones you've sent in have not been bound yet. We've kept them, but they're gonna be bound like the first two volumes soon. It doesn't even have a street address. It just says Eighth and Vine. Public Library, Eighth and Vine, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, some of the technology was uh, pretty archaic. We hand wrote a lot of labels. Oh. I can project. We hand wrote a lot of labels, but in the last year or two, we got access to, anybody remember key punch cards? <laughs> um, so we um, were able to use the facilities in the basement of the engineering department at UC and do key punching, which, you know, was one of those life skills that helped me for about two years. <laughs> but they were key punched. Um, we sent free copies to the library, had no idea until a few years later when I was working downtown, I came to the library on my lunch break and discovered the rare book section and uh, discovered the mimeograph copies of the eye and it was, uh, it was a real treat for me. But um, you know, as far as some of the beliefs, we also sent free copies to any prisoner who um, wrote to us and said, here's my address. Um, we also you know, published, uh, and I think, actually I think you guys may have started it, or Mike may have started it, but they, we would set up a little corner called Pen Pals in the paper, so anybody who wanted to write to one of the prisoners could, you know. That was part of the history. And we could talk about the technology and Imagine what we could do with today's technology. <laughs> yeah, really. Just, just a little note of the primitive technology we had. Uh, we had this young artist, a shy young woman, and she had the, a wonderful name, uh, Tecla Herbie. And, and she used to make linoleum, linoleum block art for us. So if we had a white space and we needed to fill a little art, Tecla would carve out a picture for us. And, 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 and fill it up. At Monty, I actually got to speak to Tecla um, a couple oh, wow. months ago. Yes, she's living in Piqua, Ohio. Oh, Tecla is in Piqua? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> has, has a ring to it. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a new, a new newspaper. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but she had these beautiful, I mean, just beautiful linoleum cut prints. And the one that stands out to me was a linoleum print, print uh, of Martin Luther King Jr. from the April of 68 uh, issue. It, oh it's really stunning. So I encourage everyone to head to the digital archive we created and, and take a look at that one. It's really special. See, you, you, could, you could turn, uh, you could make lead look like a photograph, but it was expensive and difficult, and we couldn't afford that. So when we were printing with lead, the, that's when Tecla would make the linoleum block that was put right in the, in the locked up lead, uh, what do you call those things the, that, that go blunk and make a print? Printing press. Printing press. Printing press. Well, yes. <laughs> The plate, the plate. What we used to do was, see, we couldn't, 
use the linotype machine because that was a high-skilled activity. We gave them the copy and a volunteer linotypist on his own time would sit there at this big machine. A linotype machine has a little keyboard down here and then it's this huge machine and it's all visible. So that there's molten lead that is cast into dye to form each line of type. And he would type each letter and then pull a lever and the whole line of type would be poured with molten lead and it was set up right away and then another lever and, and that would fall into a channel and, and come down and, and land in, a, in, a, in the bin. So that's how they did the, the regular stories, but not the headlines. The headlines you had to set by hand, and you had to read upside down and backwards to, uh, to get the, the words to put into the headlines. And then you had to cut little pieces of wood on an electric saw to tighten up the plate. So, and then you had to lock up the plate with a key that mashed everything up. Remember all that, Monty? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is, um, do you know what Warren Buffett's doing right now in his spare time? He's buying every single newspaper that closes in the United States. And he's got, I don't know, last time I heard he had 50, and they, they weren't uh, neighborhood, I mean, these were major newspapers. I think Warren Buffett, Tecla, and Piqua, <laughs> there's something going on there. Something's going on. They need to meet. And that's a whole lot more fun than this, this thing, which is just about ruined my career. Uh, and uh, that, that world's still going on. There is a brand new uh, newspaper print, printing shop, a museum. But it's an active museum. Um, they have ancient equipment there, so you have, you have an idea of what used to be. But it still is. They are using the, those printing presses in that museum for people in recovery. And they're giving them something to do you know, with, with a new life. And it's really rather poetic, more ways than one. Uh, I want to mention that the, there was a, no, a source of news that we had. Uh, the, there were underground newspapers all over the country, and there was something called the Liberation News Service, and they they would send us stuff, and we would we would re, we printed it. It was a very valuable source. I remember once we went outside the Liberation News Service. There was a famous cartoonist at the time who did political cartoons. And we, we loved one of them and printed it in our newspaper. And shortly thereafter, got a letter from his attorney that we had better not do that again. <laughs> not with me. Not her one. Not her? No. But he was famous. There, there's another printing uh, hand press company uh, here called um, somebody else besides me knows who. What's the, what was it? Not Tiger Lily? Not Tiger Lily, yes. Uh, who are very active. They just, is it Clay Street? No, uh, Clay, Street. Clay Street. But this is uh, somebody who's using um, 19th century uh, printing press, Chandler Price and Washington Presses. At 8th Street? Over on 8th Street? Letter right. Press. Uh, he was on, uh, he was on Main Street, started on Main Street, now he's in Covington. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. but. Uh, and then there is um, Gray Zeitz and uh, Brenda, what's, what's the name of his company, his press? Larkspur. Larkspur Press. Uh, so Wendell Berry, a lot of things that Wendell Berry uh, writes now and produces are, are printed on uh, these 19th century channel of Price Washington Presses. So it's not just, uh, it's not just the printed page, it's about how, how it all comes together still. Um, and um, I, I'm just trying to get a plug in for those of us who 
don't read very fast. <laughs> it's nice to have things like, this is City Beat, uh, smaller journals, you know, that are easier to read and, uh, and a lot more fun than this. For, for some of us, anyway. You've got something you can hold in your hand. So the combination of this world and this place here, I, I have to get a plug in again for the library. Chris and um, Brian, uh, and what this stands for. And not to be, anything to be taken for granted. I have watched personally as a public official appointments to boards come and go. And that's a, if you don't know, it's a big part of our existence in Cincinnati. These boards are uh, supposed to be the best and the brightest that serve as volunteers. That once was the case. It still is in some cases, but all too often it is not. They are all too political, and uh, it is so much a part of how we are governed, and uh, the decisions made here from day to day. So if I think one thing to offer would be to pay attention to who's on the health board, who's on the library board, who's on the education board. Um, somebody, you know, we just had an election to the Board of Education. How many people knew more than one of those people running for the school board? One person, maybe. So that was, um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, uh, if I had a message. Uh, Important message. Thank you, Jim. If I can throw one more question, because then we'll go into the official q and I mean, there's some amazing folks here and on the panel. Um, if you could think of somebody that hasn't been mentioned, some amazing person that you met as a result of the eye, that may not be here, that may be gone now, or hasn't been mentioned tonight, that sticks out in your head, either Monty or Ellen. I remember we did have one gay contributor who had a very painful death from AIDS. And, uh, Dwight? Dw Dwight. Wilkins. Yes, it was Dwight. Oh, he was a wonderful... Please use your mic. Dwight Wilkins was uh, the cartoonist. Once we left the Yellow Springs News with the letterpress and went to this style, the off offset printing, uh, then you could draw something and it would be photographs and put in the paper. So Dwight made these wonderful, amazing cartoons. He was very gifted. He also did beautiful hand lettering. So like, for example, the, the headline that, that was for letters from readers. He hand lettered that. He was just amazing. And you heard that he had died of AIDS. Yeah, his, his sister called me. Oh, 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 terrible. So sorry. Terrible plague. We suffered. Anyone else that you can think of that? Anybody at all? Well, I, I have to give a salute to Frankie Gerson. Frankie, a great American person. Oh, geez. I could go on and on about Frankie Gerson. Frankie was the founder of the free store. Frankie was this freaky, hippie, wild man. He was a draft, uh, well, he went A-W-O-L from the army after seeing Dr. Doolittle and uh, <laughs> become a vegetarian on the spot. Anyway, he served some time and found himself back in Cincinnati and he sold the eye for us downtown uh, on Fountain Square and up and down Vine Street. And then after the eye era, he um, was working for the dump and it just because he didn't have a profession and it was a job so he noticed all the valuable appliances that were being offloaded to the dump and he said this this isn't right people could use these and so that was the start of the Cincinnati free store which he gave his heart and soul to 
and he was he was just a great person. A I great think he just passed away in 2016. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's after he filled up 12 garages, and I don't know whether it was his parents or his girlfriend, but somebody said, "Hey, there's got to got to go somewhere else." <laughs> We don't have any more garages. <laughs> that, was the, that was the beginning of the free store. Yeah. Uh, Twelve garage fulls later. Yeah. Well, we are going to open it up to officially open it up to questions from anybody in the audience that would like to say something. Yeah, just raise, raise people your are hand. Starting, people oh. are starting to leave. I just want to thank you all for coming. It means so much to me personally to see you, to see this interest in what we've done. Thank you for coming. Any questions? Ah, oh, great. There's a... Should we march? Well, we, we, do, we do have an heir. I noticed you walked in the door over there. You, the person that the hat is, is one of our heirs in protest. Would you hold up your sign, please? Question for Mr. Jim Tarbell. Would you mind explaining the reasons that the Ludlow Garage, when it was a teenage rock club, came to an end and was closed? It was why? Yes. Why why did you finally close? And it wasn't just financial, was it? Oh, more than anything, absolutely. I mean it was uh I mean, part of me is still up there. <laughs> and although it's uh, open again to a whole different ball game, but I don't know. Uh, but uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, there was community pressure uh, from, from day one, but uh, I think we overcame that. Um, and um, it was really pretty much all financial. I, it, was, it wasn't for lack of wanting to be there. Still, to some extent, I mean, we had the 50th anniversary a couple weeks ago, and a uh, big crowd, uh, probably about uh, 50 musicians that could still walk and talk, <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> 10 bands all of whom played there 50 years ago. So, it, it, you know, it's sort of, it's, it, in some respects, it lingers on, you know. Did you have some secret that you know that? No, I just <laughs> wondered if there was anything other than what you said. No, it's, you know. Um, I think that when there's, uh, well, no, I'm, I, there is something. Uh, the world, that world really was changing, and it's a sad story about uh, a lot of the social protest that was tied up in music at the time, and that was a big part of that whole world, that it was being commercialized. And so a lot of the bands that I felt were worthy and uh, were, had a message over and above being good musicians uh, were not affordable anymore. And that is way more the case now, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what Bob Dylan cost uh, to perform here last week, but I guarantee it was in six figures. And uh, the tickets, I think, were like $65 and up. Santana, the tickets for Santana were from 80 to 600. Um, yeah, now there's still plenty of good music. Shows. Shows. Uh, there's, there's no still, more shows for 875 anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's still plenty of good music around, thank God, that is affordable. <laughs> and uh, in fact, if you go to Arnold's, <laughs> uh, there's f music uh, pretty much every night there is for free. So it, it, it has moved around and there's still lots of opportunity, but I think um, that that particular change in how we do business was a big part of the garage closing. Judge, was, do you remember Judge Cardellano? Sure. Oh, sorry. I, I just think it's poetic because it, uh, Judge Cardellano was pretty extremely conservative. It's his daughter who's one of the owners of Ludlow Garage now. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's kind of, I think, I think he's probably spinning in his grave. So. He, was, he was an interesting <laughs> study. I think there's more doing them met the eye, but uh, 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 for the most part, it's... Yeah, a nice fellow, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, he, uh, Any well, other he, questions? Well, this gentleman up front. In, in the early days of the eye, 
in the early days of the I, did you get any covert support from any establishment people? Were there any sort of secret supporters on, of the establishment? Did anybody uh, give you a pat on the back? I'm just curious. I wish. <laughs> that would have encouraged us <coughs> hugely. Never happened. I don't <laughs> Well, there That's was a good question, though. Uh, it is. One of the most fun jobs I ever had was working for Steve Gibbs at the free store installing repaired space heaters <laughs> in all those buildings with no central heat. And we had a blind man who could go into the back of them and, and find out what was wrong and fix them. So you can imagine arriving at somebody's building this 40-year-old lady and this blind man, and we're going to put together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. David, I think, Thank that, you. David, you remember Servomation? Yes. That was like the, early, the earliest uh, well-known, um, what do you call those things? C canteens? Um, vending machines. Vending machines. And Cerebro Mason was one of the leaders in the industry in the very beginning, and that was, um, what was his name? So, um, good, uh, Colin Collett, Jane Collett, and, and, and that was, and her father was a big deal Quaker, and uh, very wealthy, and, and uh, he was, was in that category of, uh, of a strong supporter, albeit quietly. But As Steve Lansky had, had his I, hand up. I had a question about the slogan. Is it true there was a slogan, I saw it in the eye? I never heard it. Slogan, slogan where? It's got to be true, I saw it in the eye. I've read that. <laughs> of course, it's true. <laughs> Any other questions out there? I'm curious about the fires that happened. So there were two consecutive fires with the independent? I only knew of one. Just one. OK. So just one. was it just the office space where you were writing the papers that burned? There was an office on Vine Street in a little row house on the uh, west side of Vine Street, about a quarter of a mile south of McMillan. And it's still there, the building is still there. And this was the uh, northmost unit in that row house that was rented by the I staff. And the records and the uh, archive and the, the everything was in there. The, uh, subscriptions and uh, the stories and the past issues and everything was there. And uh, the firebomb uh, wiped out uh, most of that. It was like a flash, big thing. Well, a firebomb is an incendiary device that makes things burn. Yeah, and so that's, that's how it burned. That's how, that's how that was, yes. And if you check out the exhibit on the third floor, the cover of the Independent Eye with that house and that story is in the display. Yeah, they, the Eye actually published, it's amazing how candid they were, right after the fire, they published pictures in the Eye of broken in filing cabinets that local police and firefighters opened with axes and stole subscription lists, as Alan said, financial information of uh, both the staff members and the subscribers. And uh, it was ruled an arson at the time, but some of the staff members who were there at that office uh, claimed they witnessed the police making snide comments as they took subscription lists and things like that. And Bonnie has a question. Ellen and Monty, do you remember if it was 1970 that there was the boat that you were talking about the schism. Was it 70? It might have been. <laughs> if we go by the issues that we received from Ellen, it would be more like early 71. 
early 71. That makes more sense to me. Why? Do you have some knowledge? Was Ted Richards still here? Yeah, he was still around. I, I hate to leave this into confusion, but there were two schisms, weren't there? I mean, there was Ted, there was Ted Richards, <laughs> and, and then, then was, there was the later one that forced us out. Right? No. Uh, Ted Richards went with the group to Vine Street. Mm -hmm. uh, My memory. Yes. And uh, later, it might have been Mike Wood, but somebody told us, did you know that Ted Richards was an agent provocateur? In other words, somebody hired by the government to infiltrate or our organization and incite us to illegal radical actions. That's what that word means. You may have seen it. It looks like agent provocateur. And do you remember that? That was that was hot stuff that he might have actually been in the employ of the government. And it added up for me. I thought it was pretty likely. Did you know Ted? Yes, yes I knew Ted. Wild man. What a man. Wild. Wild. Wild guy. Yeah. Not the, the only remembrance I have of the government affecting us were one seeing the, the FBI agents come out of the federal building and photographing us when we had a demonstration in front of the federal building. And then we got, we got um, checked for our taxes. What's the word when you're audited? And the auditor actually came and stayed at our house for a better part of the week. And I, I do believe that that was motivated because we were not a, a business of any concern. Uh -huh. Well, if there's any more questions, then we're gonna have to wrap it up here shortly. Okay, I don't really, okay. Hopefully. You're fine. Oh, I hope this is interesting. Okay, so other than the schisms over the, the provocative language and how to address police and cops and pigs and all that, was there ever um, a, a controversy within your group about the actual content or hierarchy of the content and the issues you were dealing with? For instance, did everybody, was everybody okay and on board with um, content that was not necessarily about the war but about the government and civil rights and women's issues and things like that? Was there ever, do you remember like any of the men in the group who might have, you know, or not men. I think we were pretty united yeah, I, I as feminists, yeah. as, uh, you know, integrationists and uh, all of that. I think the hot topic was the off the pigs language. I remember on one occasion um, in maybe 70, uh, as the makeup chief, uh, I slashed a whole story to insert my editorial. <laughs> and, and I, of course, came down for the, the peaceful language and the peaceful philosophy and the nonviolent approach that meant so much to me. <laughs> after slashing whatever article had to go so that I could, uh, yeah, sing, uh, auto, uh, autocratically. I deleted it, yes. All right, yeah, one more. One. Well, you know, one of the issues for now, I'm sorry, one of the issues. Good evening, may I have your attention, please? In 20 minutes, the main library will be closing for the night. If you are working on a computer, please be sure to save your work before shutting it down and pick up any items you may have at the printer. Also, be sure to take any items you wish to borrow to a self-checkout station or the checkout desk on the first floor. Once again, the main library will be closing in 20 minutes. Thank you. So, I'm a member of the IWW. They call them the Wobblies. The Wobblies! The, <laughs> the industrial workers of the world. And there is a group here in Cincinnati and northern uh, Kentucky 
for that. But one of the things is we're international. And so the whole idea of patriotism is not up at the top of our agenda, right? We're interested in international solidarity. So I just wondered whether or not that was an issue that ever came up. We were aware of the Wobblies. The Wobblies were heroes of ours. If we're heroes for people like Mark Neely, the, the Wobblies were heroes of ours. And I'm delighted to hear that there are Wobblies today in Cincinnati. Somebody has their hand up, and I think that should be the last question. So my name is Darius Clay. Uh, I've been working on the political field for at least almost 10 years uh, since I changed. I've uh, been on this lady for a very long time. Uh, but my, my question for the ones that are part of the I is what advice would y'all give people who are starting off on the uh, starting off in the realm of trying to get change done as far as taking action as far as doing a lot of different things what advice would y'all give people that's been on the political field and the ones that are just starting off uh, for when they start trying, when they start feeling discouraged, what advice would y'all give people that are in a political realm? Know the technology of the day and use it to the full. That's good, Ellen. I, I feel like the world has passed me by pretty much. I trust young people today to have a, a much stronger sense of, of what to do and how to do it than I, than I, than I am. I, I want to say in conclusion, Thank you, Chris, for, for organizing this and making that video so well made. Um, thank you. I want to thank the board for being here. I want to thank this incredible board and honor to be a part of this. Thank you all for being a part. Have a great group picture. And please Everybody gather for group who pictures. Was associated with people. the independent eye. Please come to the front here so we can take your picture.